Welcome to Sci Show Tangents. It's a lightly competitive knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me as always this week is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. And our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hi there. And the question that, of course, is weighing on everybody's minds is if you had $50 billion to buy any oh. company on Earth. <laughs> Don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I So, all right. Here's here's the actual question I want to ask you. Yeah. If you had to buy any company, the name of which I would recognize and that the people at home would recognize. So like a company that's a household name, what company you were forced to buy it and you had the resources to buy it, which company would you be like, that's mine now, y'all? I know what I would do because I have to fantasize about it all the time. <laughs> so so when I was a kid, cable TV was cool. And that mm-hmm. like at night, like weird stuff would come on and like yeah. they were just doing weird stuff all the time on cable TV, like up all night movies with hosts and just like morning mm-hmm. shows with puppets and stuff. So I would buy like FX or something or like TBS or like yeah. one of those like lesser cable mm-hmm. channels. And Some I cable just, channel that that like isn't doing particularly well anyway. Yeah. And you just like could put whatever you want on it yes. for six months before you went bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. And I would treat it as my own like <laughs> public access television channel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just get the weirdest. Sam, that's not a terrible idea. I, I, lo- so I really like the idea of a like a Netflix or a cable station that is really just the weirdest stuff. Like yeah. that's what's binding it all together. Mm-hmm. That's what's missing in the in the world these days. Yeah. Is like just the very like specific weird voice. Everything has to be so marketable now. Not yeah. for me, man. You want Dr. Demento on TV. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> all right. I love that answer. Sari, have you had thoughts? I I was trying to think of something like funny or clever. Um, <laughs> but I think Costco. I like the idea of being the guy <laughs> to offer a dollar fifty hot dog to other people for the rest of uh-huh. my life and just be known for that. Be like you, Yeah. You could just get a hot dog stand. <laughs> You know, that didn't even occur to me. I thought the Costco food court. Is it just court, the hot dog part that you like? I like the Costco food court. I think that's a great a great part of Costco. The rest of the yeah. business yeah. is fine. It seems like a lot of work. Seems like a lot of logistics. But running yeah. an affordable food court for people. That seems I, know, nice. I think about I think about that sometimes where it's like I just want I just want people to have easy food. Mm-hmm. And cuz it's so it can be quite hard. Especially yeah. to get good food. And I don't think a hot dog is necessarily sort of the pinnacle of the health food. <laughs> but no. Okay. This is my idea. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to buy uh, a, any fast food re- restaurant chain. Anyone that has a lot of locations. And they also have to have equipment for cooking food. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I convert it into, I'm like, no, you don't get hamburgers anymore. <laughs> Instead, you get pre-made meals that are refrigerated and you just like come by and there's only one thing a day. You get whatever we made that day. And you come by and you pay $3 for it. It's And you don't know what it is. Or you can. Look at the phone. You whatever. should know what it is. You can, Yeah, it'll say on the board. <laughs> it'll be like lasagna a la Hank on it. And then you'll know that it's like, oh, I like that lasagna. That is Hank's favorite lasagna. Will everything be a la Hank? <laughs> <laughs> it's called, the restaurant's now called, I'm going to buy McDonald's and I'm going to turn it into a la Hank. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's just like pre-made, just like throw it in the microwave, but it was made it fresh and it's got fresh ingredients and it's good for you. Oh, that's nice. Will people know what they're ordering or will they drive up and be like, I'd like a double pound, like quarter pounder with cheese. And then you just get a la Hank. <laughs> 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 it's enchiladas. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out, welcome. You wanted a cheeseburger? Stew. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. That's so disappointing. <laughs> you wanted hot fries? Uh, you get? You get a, a cold paprikash. <laughs> <laughs> None of us wanted to run the company as it existed. We no. all wanted to take the thing. <laughs> Radical changes. Uh-huh. And just, just do the thing that's interesting to us. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah wanted Perfect. to get rid of about 99% of her company. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would keep it around. I'd just give it to someone else. I'd be the yeah, eccentric yeah. I'm not rich good at person. This. I'm, but I am going to be good at hot dogs. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, $50 billion is a lot of money, you guys. Mm-hmm. But anyway, instead of talking about that, let's introduce what the heck we're doing here. This is a show 
called SciShow Tangents, where every week we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory and for Hank Bucks, which I will be awarding as we play, and at the end of the episode, one of them will be crowned the winner. Now, as always, we introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem this week (laughs) from... All of us, because right before we started recording, I said, is this episode not about paper? And you said, no. And I said, well, I have a great poem about paper. Uh, And so we had no poem until uh, eight minutes ago. And then we all went offline and we wrote our own tangents poems. Who goes first? I think you got to go first. Oh, my God. Well, mine's so bad. (laughs) I took the longest and I don't think it's good. Okay, here, here it is. These little things... Always are squirming, but people <laughs> think that they're vermin. Mm. But I, I say, hey, they're really great. Those worms, they're those, they're just worming. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. It took me three minutes. <laughs> it took you twice as long as me and Sari took to write our poems. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll go next because I'm excited for whatever Sari has cooked uh, okay. in oh, her I don't sick see- mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's time to learn about the worm. In the ground they squirm. They're squishy, not firm. Though they're nasty, don't spurn those slimy, lovable worms. <laughs> <laughs> kind of similar to your poem, actually. Yeah, I think, I think we may hear squirm a third time. It's possible. Uh, oh, I didn't put squirm in mine. I couldn't. Oh, wow. I, was not using rhyme zones, so my rhymes were severely limited. There once was a little long lad who wiggled around and looked sad. He ate lots of junk, then pooped it out of his trunk to feed tomatoes for your dad. Wow, nice. <laughs> we both good. did limericks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have two more stanzas if you want them. They get worse oh, as we no. go. Oh, <laughs> no. Are you serious? Wow. You had 90 what? seconds? Yeah. Okay, keep going. Yeah. There once was a tube in a vent. All hot and slimy, the gent. He has no backbone, but he does have a home. In the deep sea, there they went. That was so good. Oh <laughs> okay, one more, you. one more. Okay. There once was a wiggly worm. Not a twig or some yarn or a sperm. They are soft and wet and sometimes a threat, but they'll be around for the long term. <laughs> oh my god. Do you want to hear again what it took me three yeah. minutes to write while <laughs> Sari did that in 90 seconds? These things are Always, always are squirming. Some people think that they're vermin. But but I say, hey, they're really great. Those worms are just worming. <laughs> That's I, what I did in, not, in three minutes. But I say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that part really throws me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, Lord. Well, the topic for the week is worms. Um, Sari, what is a worm? I know the answer to this question. Oh, no such thing. There is no such I thing. It, it, it existed a long time ago when we were still figuring out animals. Then Carl uh-huh. Linnaeus in 1758 said, I'm going to come up with a class. I'm going to call it vermies. Hmm. And I'm going to describe it as any invertebrate that's not an arthropod. So not a scorpion, like the plated outsides or whatnot. And he's like, anything kind of squishy and small. That's oh, a okay. worm. Do, do, could it have legs back then? It's it's destitute of ears, nose, head, eyes, and legs. Okay. <laughs> that's a great, That's that feels like it's from a science poem right yeah. there. Yeah. But it turns out that this body plan is common and useful and uh, has been converged upon many times. Mm-hmm. Yes. And yeah. so now uh, we know that there are any number, a, a large number of phyla that are various different worms. There are like annelids or nematodes or platyhelminthes that all have the same body plan of long, flexible, either round or flat, kind of squishy, no obvious appendages. If they are, they're really mm-hmm. small. And they eat a bunch of junk. Usually they're, they're part of the decomposing part of the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like to think of, of them as just an intestine with a, a mouth. And if you have one in your intestine, then it's just an intestine within your intestine. And it does happen, <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? That happens too. But worm is just a slang word at this point. Is that yeah. is that accurate? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are lots of things that are called worms, and it is not a taxonomic group. Okay. Yes, yeah. it's more of a catch-all term, and it's even used to describe species that wouldn't be that don't fall anywhere taxonomically as worms. So, like Sicilians, 
the legless lizards are sometimes called worms because people looked at them and were like, oh, you're long and squiggly. That's a big worm. That's a big worm. Like a worm. Isn't it? Yeah. And etymologically, worm was also kind of a nickname. Uh, <laughs> just started from the root wer, W E R, which means to turn or bend. And that informed so much of our language from like awry to vertebra to wrinkle to wrist, just all kinds mm. of all huh. kinds of words stem from this to turn or bend. Then worm as a as a word, uh, W U R M or W Y R M was interchangeably used for pests, like any sort of thing, starting from insects to wiggly worms, but also to like a small snake or like a, uh, a reptile you didn't like. And that's how mm-hmm. worm became used for big snakes, aka dragons. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and so it just like kept snowballing from there. And then at some point, I really, really tried to look into the etymology of dragon because when we did our dragon episode, I wasn't doing this segment. But it seems like it comes from the verb draco, which meant to glance. And so Hello. like dra- the word dragon came from piercing eyes. And Ooh, like a, a glare that a creature would give to you, like a malevolent spirit or something. And worm described like the annoying pest or like the things that you didn't want to be around. And then a, for a period of time, they were both used kind of interchangeably, like people called fictional dragons, worms or dragons. Mm-hmm. But then mm-hmm. as as the words were used more and more, then people were like, well, we've got to have a difference between them. And so worm became small things and dragon became the mythological beast that we we think of as dragon and the rest is history. We we just decided at some point like I feel like we made the right call. I yeah. feel like yeah, I feel like war I'm like that's a worm, that's a dragon. Like mm-hmm. put the put the the thing and the word and I've I've never seen either of those words or either of those things. I'd be like zoop zoop. I know which one's which. Oh, <laughs> uh, that brings us to the quiz portion of the show. Uh this week we're going to be playing an episode of this or that. So in the 1960s and 70s, scientists took the one millimeter long nematode known as uh, Cenorhabdus elegans and developed the techniques for raising and studying this worm that would turn into an important model organism along with others like E. coli and fruit flies and zebrafish. So you know about C. elegans if you uh, do, do much work in biology. In addition to being the first multicellular organism to have its genome sequenced, C. elegans has made many other important contributions to science thanks to its simplicity. So today, in honor of this model organism, we're going to be playing Worm or Not. I will describe a scientific discovery made with a model organism, and you have to guess whether or not that organism was C. elegans or some other model organism. Does this make sense to you? Yes. Yes. Would you like to play the game? Yeah, Yeah, sure. This organism seems to love cancer cells, so much so that scientists created a device that would use the organism to detect lung cancer. The device is made up of a chip loaded with liquid media that had been around either normal cells or cancer cells, and at the other end is this organism, which can confirm the presence of cancer cells by traveling toward them. So it just loves cancer cells, so it moves toward them, which is an amazing cancer detector. So, worm or not, are, are cancer cells yummy is the question, I guess, to C. elegans. Purely vibe check here. No, yes. it ain't C. elegans. That's, a vibe. <laughs> That's just like going on, going on yeah, your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't want anything to do with that. In, in my head, C. elegans swim. And so I feel like it would, if you put a bunch of cancer cells in water, then it would all diffuse. And so I, I also don't think it's C. elegans. You are both incorrect. Oh. Cancer cells have a smell that is distinct from normal smells. And there are dogs that have been even trained to smell cancer cells. But dogs are big and they require training and a lot of food. And you have to clean up (laughs) after them. So scientists wanted to see if they could use another animal for the same purpose. And it turns out C. elegans are, for their own mysterious reasons, drawn to the smell of lung cancer cells. In previous work, researchers found that 
Uh, when faced with a choice between different drops of human urine, the worms tended to move toward urine that came from cancer patients. They are specifically drawn to 2-ethyl-1-hexanol, a molecule known to have a floral scent, maybe because it smells like food, though the exact reason is not known. So scientists created this chip with little cancer-detecting worms in it and found that they were 70% effective at sniffing out cancer cells. Wow. Wild. 70%, not really good enough for clinical use. Got to Got to get, got to train these boys up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep practicing worms. Come on. Yeah, this or that number two. To test the toxicity of a chemical, scientists devised a method that starts with mixing the chemical with cow feces. Then they added ten eggs from this organism to the mix, and then they waited for the eggs to hatch. After hatching, the individuals are monitored to see whether the chemical added to the poop has affected their development and morphology. So this is a toxicity test. Was it though worm or not? I'm going to say worm because the last one was about pee, so why not throw them in poop too? I'm going to say not worm. I was probably misunderstanding somehow, but it seems like these guys are in poop all the time, so just be like, eh, who cares? Well, they added a toxin to the poop, so they want to eh. see this is how they figure out if the... If the and we're not worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> see, Elegans, it, it, toxins can't affect me. Yeah. I'm too simple. Well, Sam, you're right. While uh, there are toxicity methods that use C. elegans, this particular technique is done using eggs from the yellow dung fly. Uh -huh. The yellow dung fly is also a model organism used to study sexual selection, but its eggs are used as described to study the toxicity of different chemicals. Last one, you guys. So despite the fact that this organism doesn't have any of the necessary tools to detect light, it is still able to avoid short wavelength light. When looking into how they do this, scientists found that this organism responds and then spits out chemicals produced by the light, like hydrogen peroxide. Light hits it, and then it can spit out the chemicals that are produced by that light, so it is able to detect it. So, but is that worm or not worm? What Weird. the hell? You, what do you mean produced by the light? Like, Yeah, apparently um, there's a chemical reaction that happens with some compound in the body that produces hydrogen peroxide. Yucca. That seems so weird. That's got to be my boy, C. Elegans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say it's the worm. They're kind of translucent, so I could see yeah. light getting in there. Stuff's going right through them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you are both correct. C. elegans does not have eyes or any light-absorbing molecules, but it is able to avoid short-wavelength light thanks to its response to chemicals like hydrogen peroxide that get produced when other compounds react in their bodies, react with lights. Uh, when the worm detects those compounds, it will reverse its direction, uh, and it will also spit the molecules into the environment because it's like, I don't need hydrogen peroxide in my body right now. While studying this process, scientists realized that the worms use their neurons to control subregions of individual muscle cells in the spitting process. And this is interesting because the general assumption is that the smallest thing a neuron can control is a single muscle cell in its entirety. But C. elegans spitting show that they might be able to get even smaller than that uh, to control specific parts of a cell. So oh. like a neuron not controlling a whole cell, but just a bit of a cell. Weird. Wow. Uh, what are they? They're just. What are they? What a... They're figuring it out, man. Okay. They're figuring out how to be tiny and simple and still survive over millions of years of evolution. Seems like they're doing a pretty good job. They're just worming down there. That's right. The worms <laughs> are just worming. <laughs> Next up, we're going to take a short break and then it'll be time for the Fact Off. Welcome back, everybody. Sari's got one point. Sam's got two, point, two points. And we're moving into the, the fact off where our panelists have brought science facts to present in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them and award Hank Bucks any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, I have a trivia question. In the 1973 children's book, How to Eat Fried Worms oh. by Thomas Rockwell, a boy named Billy is dared to eat 15 worms in 15 days. More than 40 years later, a man named Paul Rees went to his vegetable patch and dug up what would be, at 15.7 inches, the longest earthworm recorded in the United Kingdom. If Billy had to eat 15 <laughs> worms of that size, how heavy in grams would his total worm meal be? 
He only had to eat 15 worms 15 in 15 worms. days. This seems to total. Yeah, pretty doable. One, one and a half minute, probably. Thanks, one and a half seconds. minute? Fast, faster yeah. than I can write a poem. <laughs> <laughs> would you eat them all at once, or would you eat them yeah. one at a time? All at once. Okay. Just, yeah, put them just on, get put it over the, with. Yeah. Okay. Gulp. So then this British guy, what did he yeah. do? 15.7 inches. It's the long, if it, if, so if uh, Billy had to eat 15, 15. 15.7 inch worms, how how much mass would he be consuming? Time to bring out the old uh, arithmetic. I'm going to guess 1,500 grams. 1,500 1, grams. 100 grams. Just we like, got it in grams, Sam. Do you know how much a gram is? It's really throwing me off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll convert it. You can give me pounds and ounces or ounces or whatever you want. <laughs> how many is, what, what was her answer in pounds and ounces? Uh, it's 3.3 3 pounds. Of oh. Pounds. Well, I won't read you the calculation that I no, came do you, up with. No, calculate, <laughs> please. I must know, Sam. Sam's like 85 pounds. Well, I thought maybe each worm was four pounds. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's big. It's big. It's long. a big 15 worm. inches. Yeah. It could be yeah. dense, It could be a girthy worm. But I, worm. I think that they're, they're, they remain quite skinny. They're skinny. I'm still going to say, what did you say? Four pounds? 3.3 3 3 pounds. pounds. Seven pounds. Well, the answer is 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 much less than either of you oh, guessed. Shoot. It is a mere 390 <laughs> grams. So that's nearly a pound. It's 0. Ah. 0.86 pounds. Um, it's roughly the equivalent of 35 Oreos. So it's a lot. That it's is a lot. lot. But um, not not 3.3 3 pounds of worms. Would you like to know more about this worm? I would Please. love to. It was a common earthworm, so it wasn't anything special. Uh, the previous record holder was 12.6 grams. This makes Dave twice as large as, the, as that previous record holder. The bad news, oh, the worm's name was Dave. Is the word? The the b- <laughs> <laughs> I thought Dave was the first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the bad news for, the bad news is that uh, that uh, Dave did not survive being the largest earthworm as oh. he was uh, humanely with anesthesia um, killed and preserved in the Natural History Museum. Poor Dave. Poor Dave. Poor Dave. At least he wasn't yeah. eaten though. Uh Sarah, that means you get to decide who goes first. I want Sam to go first. I want to hear his oh. worm fact. Right. You rat. <laughs> <laughs> Geosmin, that nice earthy smell that occurs after rainfall or when you stir up some nice damp earth. Uh, And humans, we love smelling that junk, don't we? In fact, as we learned previously on Tangents, when Hank just really went off on how good beets smell, (laughs) we can detect (laughs) the earthy smell of geosmin better than we can detect almost any other scent. Uh, We can detect it in the air at as little as five parts per trillion. So real good at smelling it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it maybe helped like humans sniff out water way back in the day. And it makes dirt smell dirty and beets smell beady. But there is sort of a mystery associated with geosmin. Uh, It's made by lots of different organisms of a variety of different species, microscopic organisms that is. But it's not really known what advantage there is in these organisms making it. It doesn't help them eat stuff. It doesn't help them mate or anything like that. Geosmin is, as far as we have ever known, in microscopic organisms at least, just a thing that they do that smells nice. That is, until April of 2022, when a paper was released that shed just a teeny bit of light on this dirty mystery. So this research team, first of all, this is an aside, I couldn't find out exactly what they set out to do, but there's this quote from a team lead, Liana Zarubi, uh, and she says that they eliminated many possible hypotheses before finding the thing that I'm about to talk about. So I think they might've just been like, look, we're gonna figure out what this stuff does no matter how long it takes us. And they did, I guess. So anyway, humans generally love the smell of geosmin, like I said, and you would think that worms, of all the little guys in the world, would love it too, because they live in so much dirt. Mm -hmm. But the C. elegans worm, which we were just talking about, to them, this smelly smell could be the smell of death. So the April 2022 paper reported that C. elegans could taste geosmin in their environment and seemingly did everything that they could to avoid areas with geosmin in it and microscopic organisms that produced geosmin. Uh, in this case, it was streptomyces. Uh, and when mutant C. elegans that couldn't taste the, the geosmin ate the streptomyces, those C. elegans died. So 
Geosmin does nothing for the Streptomyces, uh, and the Geosmin itself is not the thing that's poisonous to C. elegans. Uh, it seems to just purely be a warning signal, and mm. one that's beneficial to both C. elegans and the bacteria at that. Uh, the researchers stated that they didn't know of any other compound produced by bacteria that was just a warning chemical, like Geosmin seems to be. So does this entirely answer the mystery of why soil-dwelling bacteria make Geosmin? Who knows? I ain't a bacteria, but there are <laughs> millipedes that use geosmin to communicate with each other. So maybe it's just like some weird chemical that little guys use to have little conversations. It's a way for C. elegans to avoid the bacteria. Yeah. And the C- a bacteria to avoid getting eaten, I suppose. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a, any, any warning from like a, like a red bu- butterfly yeah. that's like, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. Like a poisonous so tree frog or whatever, yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. It's like, gotcha. you're not going to eat me. I'm not yeah. going to mess with you. We're going to both be okay. And and we like and we're like sniff sniff sniff. We can smell that too. Yeah. But completely unrelated to why it is being created. In Seemingly the first place. completely unrelated. I don't yeah. do we know have any like any idea why we can smell it so good? No. I think you named it the the water guess. Yeah, there's so, so there's like two two versions of that question. There's like physically is it like extra easy to detect and so we can just detect right. it better? Or did we evolve to be able to detect it really effectively in, in, because maybe it helped us get closer to water? Which, to me, that seems like a big question mark and not, not one that we know the yeah. answer to. Because I feel like, I don't know, it's certainly important to find water. But I feel like mostly we know where to find water because we live nearby where we've, our ancestors lived and they know yeah. where the water is. Mm-hmm. But, uh, right. Like it wouldn't come in handy for very long because we pretty much have it wired in where the yeah. water was, right? Yeah. Be like, oh, yeah, it's there. We know where it is, but I don't know. You weren't around back then. I wasn't. I was not <laughs> in charge of the evolution of, of humans. Uh, so, Sari, what do, what do you got? What do you got for me? So we nickname lots of worms based on where they live, presumably because it's an easy way to tell them apart. Earthworms live in the dirt, <laughs> while uh-huh. marine worms swim in water. Intestinal uh-huh. worms are parasites that live in other animals, uh-huh. and tube worms live in lava tubes. So we got all the... Uh, categories and this convention also makes it fairly easy when you find a new wriggly guy somewhere totally unexpected like in 1877 when some researchers were exploring muir glacier in alaska and stumbled across ice worms uh, <laughs> which are and ice worms are just a couple of centimeters long and kind of look like loose black threads scattered across glacial ice Ooh. when they emerge in summer afternoons and evenings. And in ah. fact, they were given the scientific name M. solifugus in 1898 to describe how they hide from the sun during the brightest parts of the day. And since the 1800s, ice worms have been found in snowfields and glaciers across the Pacific Northwest in the U.S. and Canada in concentrations of anywhere between 800 and 2,600 worms per square meter, meaning that there are probably billions of them lurking in each glacier. Oh. (laughs) Which is absolutely wild. There's not nothing there. Um, And to make this icy lifestyle possible, they have lots of weird adaptations. They have really high concentrations of melanin in all their tissues to protect from the Mm. sun's UV rays, but no eyes or other photoreceptors that we know of. They use tiny bristles to hook onto and squeeze in between ice crystals, which we don't fully understand because ice is pretty closely packed together, but that might be why they emerge in summer because it's kind of meltier. And they have a very narrow range of temperatures where they can survive, somewhere in between negative five to positive to five degrees Celsius. Mm. Wow. Uh, and this works for them because glacial ice usually stays a consistent zero degrees Celsius year round, thanks to the reflective surface in the summer and mm. the chemistry of water and insulating snow in winter. And thanks to a combination of some antifreeze proteins and cells packed full of the energy molecule ATP, ice worms are actually most active at zero degrees and get sluggish as they stray in either direction. At negative five degrees Celsius, they start to freeze and die. And at five degrees Celsius, which is around 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Too damn hot. Yeah, their membranes start to liquefy. And so they those huh. worms melt 
along with the water oh. ice. And as far as we can tell, ice worms are an important part of the circle of life in these fairly barren glacial areas. They eat things this like snow so algae or pollen grains. Oh, and of course, snow algae. Yeah, you know. Um, there's enough <laughs> snow algae to support 800 <laughs> worms per square meter. You no, know, <laughs> all the watermelon snow that <laughs> you just don't see. Okay, I um, guess. Yeah. And they are eaten by small birds that are flying through. Um, but yeah, okay. that being said, there are still a ton of mysteries surrounding ice worms. So this is where your question gets into, uh, like what they do while they're buried in ice and we can't see them, what they evolve from, how they mate. And even researchers who have kept them in a fridge for a year without feeding them haven't figured it out yet. They're just like, are these the same worms? Are they different worms? I don't, I don't know. They're there. And the people who are interested in ice worms are kind of in a rush to learn as much as possible because as the glaciers melt away with a changing climate... These worms will Ooh. too. This sounds fake. This is fake. <laughs> I made sure this one wasn't a hoax. This one wasn't added to Wikipedia <laughs> 10 years uh, ago. I, I, I'm I glad to know a bit about ice worms. Now I know not to pick one up because I will heat it up and it will melt. Yeah. Oh, you, no. Immediate, like a big fire giant to him. Yeah. Yeah, immediate worm death just at the tip of my <laughs> all of my fingers. You asked one of the things that they, they don't know the answer to is what they're related to? I think so. so we I know, feel like that's not that hard to figure out. We know their species and we know, I guess, how they got to where they're going. We think they were carried by bird feet. Their species name is Mesenchytraeus solifugus. They're annelids. They're annelids, yes. We know, okay. we've, we've scientifically classified them, but... Like how they got there and how why they just live in this range of temperatures. So I could have phrased that better. But how they why, do they like come up to the surface for some reason? That's what we don't really know. They just do. Yeah, they they hang out at the surface at the end of summer days, and then and they, then bef- but other times they're just like down there between the ice crystals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the researchers who observe them know that you have to go during certain times of the year and certain times of the day if you want to see them. And sometimes you see a couple, but then if you go during the right time, then you see like hundreds and thousands of them just wriggling around. Whoa. It's your time to study them. And then they disappear again. And you're like, well, Mm. goodbye worms. There's still so much of the earth for us to understand. Mm -hmm. All right. So is it this amazing chemical that we can smell and that may end up being uh, a way for bacteria to warn off worms and that's the whole reason it ever existed in the first place or is it cool little ice worms sam's already ahead and i think i'm gonna go with with sam's fact oh wow. uh, i feel like that what that has been a pretty big mystery and i feel like more of the mystery was solved whereas where sari is more like here's a mystery i'm like but i want to know more come about back in a few years and you figure it out Sarah. Yeah, exactly <laughs> you gotta fund some research <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ooh, that would That's be a fun what... end game scenario for tangents. We all have to get really rich and just start like <laughs> with my fifty billion dollars. I'll fund yeah. ice worm yeah. research. Here's what my scientists figured out this week. What did your scientists figure out this week? <laughs> oh, how quaint! Oh, thank you for doing all of the work while we talk about it. <laughs> okay, I thought I would really get you. You thought you had? I me. thought I, I had you. Ice worms. This man loves Geosmen. You gotta know about Hank. <laughs> <laughs> well, that means it's time to ask the science couch where we ask listener questions to our couch of finally honed scientific minds. Oasis on Discord at Blazek and several other listeners asked, it's assumed that worms are good for soil and plants, but I've heard that earthworms are invasive and can harm ecosystems in some parts of North America. What's the real story here? It's both of those things. Mm -hmm. So like um, worms are definitely good for your garden. I feel like, you know, making softer, good aerated poopy soil. That's not true. I don't know what to believe. Sari, is that true? Or should we? Or is everything up for grabs? Don't need to go out there and eat all the worms. (laughs) Get them out of there. So yes, it is true. (laughs) They, both things are true. Worms are de- <laughs> decomposers and they help. So aerated soil is good both to get gases down there and for water trickling down. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the castings that they poop out are good concentrated nutrients that don't leach out of the soil like fertilizer. They, they're, they stick around and provide mm. nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus or potassium and the other stuff that plants mm 
need to incorporate to grow big and strong. So worms and gardens are good. Many plants thrive in ecosystems with worms, terrestrial worms in the ground or marine worms in the water. Like they're a good food source. They're, they're part of the, the cycle. That keeps everything growing good. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> the most recent glacial period in North America was the Wisconsin glacial episode. And if you look it up, it covered a lot of Canada and the upper Midwest of the United States and a lot of the Northeast, so like New England and some of like Idaho, Montana, Washington. It's it stopped kind of like the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. So in the places that were covered by Wisconsin glaciation, where the ice sheet expanded out and then retreated, earthworms died out. Oh. There wasn't enough plant growth and nutrients. There wasn't enough like moistness. There wasn't enough food. So earthworms around 75,000 to 11,000 years ago died out in that part of North America. And that thus, thus came the problem with invasive earthworms. So without earthworms there, the forests, particularly the deciduous hardwoods in upper North America, got used to growing without an abundance of decomposers. Uh. And they got used to layers and layers of leaves and different nutrients layering up. And uh, through adaptive evolution, like through the chance and and plants surviving, Mm -hmm. they started having root systems that took advantage of nutrients closer to the surface. These nutrients that pile up over time rather than being incorporated deeper Um, unaerated soil, like more compacted soil, and even things like seeds just drifting to the surface and kind of getting buried in the leaf litter and other animals that like camouflage in the leaf litter and whatnot. And so there have been several rounds of invasive earthworms, (laughs) and they just change the nutrient composition. It's not necessarily like a a black and white good or evil, but it's increasing the availability of some nutrients that the plants aren't used to having at shallow depths and eroding this organic material, this like thick layer um, that is used to building up. They're eating seeds that are normally just scattered across the top of the forest and Mm -hmm. pooping them out deeper so the plants can't grow. Like it's changing Mm. the types of plants that can grow. And so a lot of these old growth forests are getting stressed out with inv- invasive earthworms because it's just changing how nutrients are being cycled around and what are available to these plants that have evolved over thousands and thousands of years. All of a sudden, they're like, whoa, this is different mm-hmm. than what I'm used to. And it's not in an intentional way like agriculture where humans are like studying the plants and what they need and then adding bits and pieces. It's just like worms are here doing their worm thing and the plants Mm -hmm. are suddenly having to adapt. Here's how I'm feeling a little bit. Correct me if I'm being awful. Yeah. We're not going to fix this problem. (laughs) Doesn't seem like it. Yeah. (laughs) Seems like the worms are there and it's hard. You can't be like, we're not going to like dig out all the worms and be like, ah, we have to, we're going to make a worm free land. Doesn't sound, it sounds like they're stressing out these forests. It doesn't sound like they're like destroying the forests. It sounds a little bit like somebody kind of wants to write an article about how earthworms are bad because that's counterintuitive. And like earthworms are bad for the environment. You're like, oh, I kind of want to click on that because that's not, that's not a sort of what I've heard. And like, yes, but there's nothing you would do about it. And also, <laughs> they are good for your garden. Mm-hmm. And also, it seems a little bit like earthworms, they, they it did exist in various places in North America. They just hadn't like recolonized that area yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the problem is, is they were introduced by humans on a time scale right. that is so short in the grand scheme of evolutionary time yeah. that it's a shock to the system. Yeah. If you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week, or join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on Discord. Thank you to at Vita Bjornen, 
at Raccoon Required and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. If you like this show and you want to help us out, super easy to do that. First, you can go to patreon.com slash scishowtangents to become a patron and get access to things like our newsletters and our bonus episodes. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That's helpful and it helps us know what you like about the show. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell tell people people about us. us. Thanks for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. And I've been Sam Schultz. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz, who edits a lot of these episodes along with Seth Glicksman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Paolo Garcia Prieto. Our editorial assistants are Deboki Chakravarty and Emma Douster. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing. In 1972, in York, England, we unearthed a fossilized human poop that's about 19.5 centimeters or eight inches long, making it the biggest human coprolite found so far. It's quite a turd. <laughs> yeah. It dates back to around 800 CE, so it most likely came from a Viking's butt. And inside this poop rock, researchers found eggs from two kinds of parasitic nematodes, a Ceres lumbricoides, also called a roundworm, and Trichurus trichuria, also called a whipworm. And these worms live in human intestines and cause problems like stomach aches and diarrhea. So who knows what factors led to this Viking getting constipated enough to poop out a huge solid log instead of diarrhea mush. But we can be thankful it happened so that we could learn that our ancestors had parasitic worms. He was on vacation. That's what it was. (laughs)